world, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. about kindness is looking at people as people and not as I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. Hello, I'm Ian Rankin. Uh, I've been with the Edinburgh International Book Festival basically since day one. I went as a student, as a reader, as a fan of writing. Uh, later on, I was invited to go as an author, which was a thrill. And it's a spectacular experience. It's a meeting of minds. It's a way to open your mind to new experiences, to new ideas, nuanced debate, entertainment, something for every age group. And that's what keeps me going back year after year after year. Long may it continue. Hello, I'm Andres Nicolas Ordrica. I'm a writer and educator based in Edinburgh, Scotland, and I'm also the Community Development and Events Manager with the Scottish BAME Writers Network. It is my great honor to welcome you today to our event, the Scottish BAME Writers Network Showcase, done in partnership with the Edinburgh International Book Festival. The name of today's event is Scotland's Literary Heritage Then and Now, we took inspiration from James Baldwin and a quote he said in 1962, the report that only the poets can make. In 2020's global climate, what might a report by Scottish writers look like? How can poetry speak back to Scotland's literary heritage and complex relationships with nature, colonialism, justice, and language? We'll shortly be hearing from four poets who represent the diverse um, plethora of, of takes you can have with poetry in Scotland. But before I introduce those four poets, I wanted to give you a rundown of what the event will look like. We'll be hearing a selection of work from each of the poets, and then they'll join me in conversation with some questions that look at their work and l larger legacies of uh, literature within Scotland. And then we'll move to a Q&A discussion with you, the audience, wherever you are. But uh, enough about that. I'd like to uh, have the honor of introducing our poets for you. First, we have Hannah Lavery. Hannah Lavery is a Scottish writer, poet, and playwright. Her pamphlet of short fiction, Rocket Girls, was published by Postbox Press in October 2018. And her pamphlet, Finding Sea Glass, Poems from the Drift was published by Stude Rubard Press in May 2019. The Drift, her autobiographical play, was produced by the National of Theatre of Scotland for a nationwide tour in 2019. 
Her most recent play, The Lament for Sheku Bayou, was commissioned by the Royal Lyceum Theatre for the Edinburgh International Festival. She was awarded a new Playwright Award for Playwrights Studio Scotland and was named one of BBC Writers Room Scottish Voices of 2020. Next, we have Jeanette Ayachi. Jeanette is a Scottish Algerian poet and writer based in Edinburgh. Her debut poetry collection, Hand Over Mouth Music, was published by Pavilion Press. It went on to win the Saltire Poetry Book of the Year Literary Award in 2019. She was the founder of the Undertow Review, a multidisciplinary journal for poetry, art, and photography. She has been a critic for The Afternoon Show and has written poetry for BBC Radio 4 and appeared on the BBC art series Loop. She is currently working on a memoir about traveling alone and exploring desire, culture, and landscapes entitled Loner Lust, Postcards of a Passed On World. Next, we have Courtney Stoddart. Courtney is a Scottish poet, a Scottish Caribbean poet and performer who has performed nationally and internationally, including at the Scottish National Poetry Gallery, the Scottish Poetry Library, and the Flupe Festival in Rio de Janeiro. She took part in BBC Words First 2019 and was published in the Use Words First anthology. She has led roles in theatrical productions, including The Lament for Sheku Bayou at the Lyceum Theatre during the Edinburgh International Festival in 2019. And last but certainly not least, we have Heather H. Young. Heather is a poet, artist, literary critic, and theorist, currently based in Dundee. Her poetry, poetry objects, and artist books have been performed and exhibited internationally, and an archive of these works is held in the Scottish Poetry Library. She is also the author of On Literary Plasticity, published in 2020, and Spatial Engagement with Poetry, published in 2015. So I'd like to give a very warm welcome to our four poets, and I hope you are doing so as well wherever you are. So um, now we have the great honor of hearing from each of these um, brilliant poets that represent just the diversity that is Scottish poetry. Uh, and first, we'll start off with Hannah. Hi. Um, so I'm going to read uh, two poems for you today. Um, so I will. So this is... Um, called Flying Bats. I was invited here, I'm sure I was, to read my poetry. That's what the email said. I've been writing a lot about trees. Oh, there's this nest I found in a hedge. Blue wee eggs. A starling, was it? I well, I was invited. That's what it said. Tonight, for all you lovely folk, I'm unpacking my poetry suitcase. Ta-da! the traveling poetry salesman, that'll be me. And they say after, they say, I love how you spoke about found nests as a metaphor for immigration. Truth is, I've always been here. I was just writing about this wood at the back of my house, about a nest I found, how at night I duck the bats as if they might fly into my hair, even though I know I duck even though I know they know this place just as well as they know I know this place. Still, I duck. Um, and my second uh, poem I'm gonna read is called Safe Space. Um, and it was part of Lament for Sheikh Abayo. Safe space, they had said, like it was a given, like it was safe to be all of your choices, the good of you, the bad of you, the ugly, like all of you would be free here. They would judge you as we judged ourselves. Holding space, a door held open. Safe space, they had said, but that space so easily dissolves like sugar boiled. Our heart floods through the air vents, rises up from shelves lined with good intent and entitled anthologies titled, Hear Me, Hear Us, Please, Patchy. Patches worn like the way my skin is browner there, lighter there, like sun dapples, negligible, in whispers. Looks given to us like apology, 
hiding their eyebrows raised, eyes rolled exchanges as they let us into space left in corners in rooms that once stored boxes. And she finds me there, declares herself an ally, like I am to congratulate her, mistakes me taking the knee as worship, as gratitude, not defiance, not power, offers me her voice and replaces mine, gives me help in hand and I think to bite it, but I am full, full of it. They are screaming its satire from the front pages, his face pink, hair cut like Trump, as if I wouldn't recognize the secret handshake there, the dog whistle. Remember my funny tinge, remember half of me is trained to hear it, that I know the welcome, the belonging is conditional, skin deep. Safe here in this place, this safe place, and we say to our wayward sons, our daft lads, the lads, come on pal, take it easy son, what have you taken son, what are you on son, you can't be out here off your face son, but they saw black man said black man, they saw terrorist said terrorist, sorted it in 30 seconds, over in five minutes, see it, say it, sorted, say it. Sheku Bayo, say it. And we said safe place, safe place, aye. But it so quickly turns bitter, hostile, shifts. It shifts, spinning, spinning the wheel of fortune to shut door. Our welcome, that belonging, unconditioning. This is a safe place, we said, like it was a given, generously given, like it was safe to be all of your choices, the good of you, the bad of you, the ugly like all of you would be free here, that we would judge you as we judged ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. I love whenever you, I, I've, I've heard you perform Safe Space before, and I think something that is really uh, harrowing about it is knowing that you did write that for in 2019. And I know you wrote that um, sort of around springtime in 2019 and how a lot of those ideas are um, still relevant in 2020 and that I know that we'll explore later in the questions, but thank you for sharing that. So next we will have um, a reading from Jeanette. Hi there. So I'm going to read you um, a poem in response to a uh, Scottish writer before us, Muriel Spark. Um, and it's a poem in response to her novel The Hot House by the East River. Elsa's shadow falls towards the sun. It starts with a quote by René Char. In my land, we don't question someone who has been touched deeply. There is no malign shadow over capsized boats. Infatuations are spells. Your shadow will have to surface in that space at some point. Spells are broken, as easily as violin strings, capsizing under one possessed. Oh, the quantumness of it all. Did I tell you? I cast a different shadow, no matter the light. It goes in the wrong direction, escapes through discos and clubs at night, reels in the glitz and glamour, the blitz and hammer. We are in 1970s New York, for Christ's sake. Our hearts are already hit by a V2 bomb. Look at the quivering East River, the Pepsi sign neons, leaves in Central Park mixed with kicked up psychoanalyst bills as the heat fog lowers above the city like the engine matter of a spaceship spilling across those gunmetal Swiss mountains. Yes. I am at my calmest on those lakes in Zurich, sleeping with the enemy to uncover the truth, night shifts, canteens and bunk bunkers. When there is a war on, one lives dangerously. Madness develops, perpetual heat, looking out. Something captivating about this East River though. And I will never understand those champagne colored women pointing out my shadow in shoe shop queues. I am shadowed, by my husband's psychoanalyst. So much left to the imagination, they wanted evidence, liquid rooms, a hint of lace, a line of purring taxis. How long before we are all shot down by Hitler's U-boats? These military messages keep me awake at night like cats in heat, fiddling with frequencies, cities and factories. 
We can become immune to distortions, sirens wailing up First Avenue and the door screech suddenly sounds like Bach. My husband hunts around the room for my shadow when I am gone, lost to existence. All those German prisoners I took for walks in the country, their staggers and stoops crossing my shadow, all the hours I wasted waiting to be rescued from police stations. I have supernatural communications, I tell them. What is different about me? My shadow tells the truth of uncanny misalignment, the misdirected physics, dust from the East River. My shadow always makes the same gesture, despite the morning sun opening ahead of me. It hangs from my sleeve, falls like a flung coat across the bed. Sometimes my shadow shadows me. We are the last one dancing, two overnight women in a silhouette show. Why do you think I carry this crocodile bag full of acrid rotten tomatoes? Wear my earrings of diamonds and rubies so well? People look straight at my shadow instead of my face. Do they see how my husband's shadow touches mine? Defies that unbearable letting go, hiding behind common distractions. It's getting hotter in here. The central heating never turns off. I am externalized. I am the central nervous system, unconnected with no sure setting. So let our deadly bodies dance down 7th Avenue, setting fire to all your watchful demons. Clean up your dust and forgotten sketches as you sleep. When the music reaches full volume, the dead either stop talking or shout louder. Even the shelter won't hold the next blast. The soprano keeps singing and I keep showing up late in white fox furs, high voltage with unsteady foundations, like a tampered with parachute until walls collapse and all lungs are blitzed with exploded vodka tonics. Thank you Thank so you. much, Jeanette. You have such um, a masterfulness at narrative poems that really play with senses of space and place that I, I'm really keen once we get into the discussion to explore because you do this a lot actually in your collection um, going back and forth between Scotland and Algeria but specifically how you play with the cityscape of Edinburgh and Glasgow um, I'm keen to sort of divulge into but I, so I'm really glad that um, your, your poem spoke to, to urban spaces. So next, we will get to hear from Courtney. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I'm going to be reading an extract from my poem called Skin Feriority. <clears throat> How did the day become afraid of the night? The light become afraid of the dark? Take a look around you and what do you see? White faces modelled across every city can't escape the white supremacy it splashed across your TVs and magazines. Say hello to the white Jesus, hell below, church say pray on your knees for us, just believe in us. A white man who came from Palestine, laughable that this white man turned water into wine. Well, I will take my turn and I will pray to the divine and I will ask father, was it you who created such divide? Told me to turn the other cheek, but take an eye for an eye. Are you taking backhanders from the devil on the sly? I take it that so you could build your white heaven in the sky. Make us fear death when the most natural thing is to die. Was it you who put a white man's picture on the shrine and said worship? The same God who gave the white man the whip, the quick academic wit to enslave melanated bodies and place them on slave ships. And excuse me if you cannot handle it, but this lasting legacy of incessant white supremacy is sick. So where is the remedy? Racism is a disease. So I ask you, God, please, when your missionaries spread the gospel, how was and is it possible to alleviate those responsible for their actions? So contradictory is your philosophy, it's beyond recognizable hypocrisy existing in every colonial faction. Your missionaries quote illiteracy as a signifier of the primitive, well, God, I pick up my pen, but can you handle it? The words that I write, God, would my words mean more to you if I were white? God, do you know white from wrong? God, have you been white for long? 
as white as the snow that falls in the Christmas parades, the masquerades, the one whose words enslaved and missionaries degrade and spread hate, conditions to manipulate. And I'm sure the Lord knows that the missionary style is referring to rape the one whose words engraved in the minds and hearts of a people. Inferiority, skin inferiority, the one whose Bible dictates that one group is entitled to the Holy Land and murder the Palestinian people on demand. Well, God, if this is your call, then you and the devil must be playing ball. Oh, and God, please explain why your Pope has an upside down cross hanging from his wall. If God is omniscient, he has answers to it all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Courtney. I'm very glad to have heard you perform that. I was actually watching your performance of Skin Inferiority uh, yesterday at the, from the Fruit Market Gallery from a few years ago. Um, and I just, I think you touch on so many points about right saviorism, the erasure of Jesus's um, Palestinian heritage or would have been Palestinian heritage. And I know you do that also in your poem, Denial, which was part of the Fringe of Color Film Festival. You have references um, to, ha to the use of, uh, of religion and how we play with identities and how it really got me questioning sort of my Catholic upbringing and how I grew up thinking of Jesus in this way and really just questioning how we are made to think and believe these certain things that go against actually what would be historical accuracies. And I know we have a question that we're going to dig into about the poet playing the role of historian. Um, so I'm keen to hear your thoughts. But of course now, we, before we move into questions, we will have, uh, we have the honor of hearing from Heather. Hello. So um, two, two poems from something relatively new, which is a, um, something written, a sequence of poems and prints that was written or created in correspondence with the, Scottish, um, the National Library of Scotland for their upcoming exhibition, The Eye of a Stranger, Henry Liston's Travels. So they're from Anatolia, the first Haseki Echo, the second uh, Hymetus. What is this river, strange, luminous, where my dolphin now turns shade, continue as is their wont, shrill echoes amongst shoals to fish, and unreal, strange, luminous, fish dart in grotesquerie, but lie, dash away from shadows of bridge-stranded fishermen, bathed in the glow as life below the surface is renewed. What is tone changes, and they say it is plankton superbloom, pollution. They say it is the gods, one of the single gods, call for us to pray with metal upon metal of bell, and such inhuman iron appeals to whom and who could bear to listen. Whatever it is, it is not that. The river turns, and the thousand roses act out, try their richnesses of pigment to no avail. The buildings, chalky efforts before unseen, strain against river stain. Acacia even cannot harm the effect, luminous with its thorns. This city is not used to haunting the periphery. The refusal turns the modesty of Cyprus and Olive Garden so much more a steady fact of life. So here, in dim shade, I and no pattern could weave the color nor any dye. We could not cut in stone this river if we tried, weave it to cloth if we tried. There is nothing to commemorate this. So I've nothing to do but sit, eat green iced almonds, watch the glow. No, we will not see its like again, not you and I, nor sons, nor daughters. And will you, my life, in these gardens see again? Where Leila never sang, I sing a warmth beside me and forget in golden notes the sweep of hair not mine 
the night my paintbrush put to shame. Your fingers as you toy with grass more deaf than dolphin, fish or hook, needle or thread. I reach out with this, my voice. You say, time comes to us all and look, the river turns. Grey waters lap, grey dolphins sing for fish, grey fish twist, grey from grey hooks under the grey bridge. My palaces are stark, and the roses, my roses, my soul sigh relief in fleshy petals fall exhausted to marble and look. Yes, the river turns. How is it, Pliny, that honey falls as Sirius rises? She sopped at, she flames, she body of Manu, ah, of beryl and juniper, she causing, yes, honey astrobeletal that glows and the flow flowing of time, struck red against the observations of eye closed, against all inclination, alabor there, and in opposition to the Pleiades, from whom such perspiration of sky comes not at all, this dew that clings. You can see her best, even in daylight, at, yes, quadrature, should you know it, but the dew, honey, only at dawn, look west, back to that city for such news. Ask, in what tongue is it you find for it? Ask, then, how is it on this mountain or sky, the wolf or horse or hunter, this crazy mountain howls down such gold? Thank you so much, Heather. And thank you to all four of you for your um, performances and the work that you have shared that has given me lots of food for thought to dive into our questions. So my first question, uh, I'm going to pause it to Heather and Courtney first. And it was largely inspired, Heather, by looking at your poem, um, Hoi Sound, an Icarus poem, which I was able to view on the Scottish Poetry Library's website. But I know these are also archived physical works of art. And then, Courtney, your use of spoken word and poetry as performance. Um, so I'm just interested in your approaches to your craft and what influences your decisions to create poetry the way you do and why you choose the forms you choose to write in. So if we could start with you, Heather. Not a small question, Andres. <laughs> um, yes, you mentioned Hui Sound, which is a long hand scroll for any of you who've not seen it. It's sort of three meters long by one foot and um, sometimes gets installed, stuck up on a wall, and more often is hopefully read and handled as it sort of unfolds itself. So the poem itself is quite a long poem, which is a translation of various old Norse kennings, or an exploded translation, um, so I've taken liberty with it, a translation of all sorts of old Norse kennings about the sea. And the reason that it took on the form that it did, and I'm looking across at you and I know that I should be looking at the camera. Um, the reason it took the form it did that I was keen to, to kind of arrive at a sense in the poetic work, as well as in, in the physical form itself, of a sort of simultane simultaneity. So when we look at the sea, we can't see, this, we can't see the sea, we can't see all the sea. Um, and so what I was trying to come to was to find a way of printing that would do that. And the way that I came across, which is something that I've been working quite a lot with in my printmaking, um, which also calls quite neatly to a feminist tradition in printmaking, is um, a cyanotype printing. And so the whole poem was set up and then printed, and the whole poem emerged at the same time to itself um, as it was exposed under the sunlight. And for me, that was a kind of a really important um, part of the process and part that I think you get to grips with as you handle the work because you can never quite see all of it at once, which is also calling a little bit on a, a Chinese tradition of kind of hand scroll and the idea that with those, you kind of, I suppose you ethically engage with the landscape through acknowledging the fact that you can never see all of it at once. Um, 
because none of the scroll is ever exposed simultaneously. Yeah, I, I'm just like hearing you speak about that and the idea of sort of the temporality of experiencing and interacting with your poem. And I think Courtney, in a way that really does marry well with your practice. And I know we were speaking earlier about how um, in the wake of the death of, or the murder of George Floyd, and as there's been a global, a rise in global awareness of Black Lives Matter, that you're, you have seen an influx of interest in your work and that it, you know, you write, um, your poetry, but that people have found your poetry in light of what's going on in, in the world right now, and that there is this sort of temporal aspect. So I'm interested in how, um, how that influences you, knowing sort of what, how you go about your writing and then addressing what's going on in the world right now. Do you see your poems living beyond the here and now? or do you write to address what's going on in the world around you? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the main thing for me is that, you know, as a poet, you have the potential to be, you know, a sycophant, a, a poet of the court, or you can kind of align yourself with the sort of long lineage of rebellious poets who challenge the, the dominant power structures of the time. And that's certainly more where I like to um, align myself with because, yeah, I, I'm deeply dissatisfied with the way the world <laughs> operates. Um, and it, yeah, I suppose I'm particularly interested in the way that sort of technologies of power can be, you know, utilised to create these sort of subconscious um, social arrangements which alienate us from one another. And I suppose in my work, I really seek to, to unpack that in, in whatever way that I can. Thank you, thank you. I know that was not sort of an easy question <laughs> to lead into. Um, uh, but now you both will be able to take a bit of a break because my next question is uh, particularly aimed at Hannah and Jeanette. Um, sort of looking, Hannah, at your poem, Scotland, You're No Mine, its use of Scots in, in, throughout your poetry and your theatre work. And then, Jeanette, what I was alluding earlier to, your representation of both Glasgow and Edinburgh in your collection, Hand Over Mouth Music. Um, the title of our event is Scotland's Heritage Then and Now. So my question um, to you is, do you see your poetry playing on the work of Scottish poets from the past? Is it, do you see your poetry working in conversation with Scottish artistic or cultural traditions or histories? Or to throw a left field question out there, do you see your work as working in the present and the now and sort of free entirely uh, of the past? So I think if we start with you, Jeanette. Okay. Um, I think we, we can't not pay homage to our ancestors and those who walk before us. Um, and if you think about it, we are redefining the same landscapes and same cities that they themselves um, inhabited and embodied. So um, we can't avoid the clues that are given from our elders to help us on our own journey. Now, I mean, each generation defines itself there's, it changes, it transforms, it shifts. Um, and that's with the aid of those that went before us. I'm, I, I'm a poet of my time um, in this life, not any other time. What past lives um, affects me inadvertently. Um, if there's a message that needs to be channeled, uh, poets, I think they help, you, they help you open up to feel things. And I think that's the report that we make. Um, so my work's always glazed with um, an emotion of its time, the temporal relation to the, the here and the now. And, and I think 2020, it's just been a year that we've all been stifled and shook and, and stilled. And I think that the report that we're making now in this luminary liminal world of lockdown and fertile solitude in, and time of shift and transformation, I think that as we upgrade, we're gonna give newer ideas um, and different ways to, to go back in time um, and redefine our past to then reenact and envision our future to be something more like the way we want our present to be right now. So my work is always kind of centered in the now because it's autobiographical and it's kind of chronological in that way. Um, it's embedded in the landscape. 
Thank you. Um, my segue to you, Hannah, and this is sort of um, leading because I know I've heard you speak about it. Um, so I wanted to just hear a bit from you about the lament for Sheikh Gubayu because I know that you've talked about how that actually does play on a Scottish um, cultural tradition of women and the lament um, as a sort of a mourning act. When you went about to write your play, which I would I see it, and I don't know if you would, as long form poetry in a theatrical setting, but the way you you wrote the play has such poetic tendencies and the way the actors carry it out. I'm interested in sort of the research you might have done into the actual heritage of the lament and that practice and then how does that feed into um where you took the play okay <laughs> right <laughs> quite a lot to unpack um it's interesting i kind of find i think it's difficult to unpack your influences in the sense that you know i was educated and you know from scotland i was educated in scotland um so a lot of that is just who I am. So trying to unpack who you are is quite hard. Um, in terms of the lament, it was, I think I, you know, it wasn't like I went into huge depth of research. I kind of, I looked at this tradition of the, of the lament and I looked at a few, I looked at a few laments I could find that were talking about how women would come together and they would lament a lost soldier or a lost, a lost boy. Um, and I think this is what kind of informed me about having women lament Sheikh Kubayo, but also because I was also asked to write quite a personal um, piece, a kind of personal reaction to the death of Sheikh Kubayo, but also to what that said about Scotland and racism in Scotland and about institutional racism in Scotland and, and what that was about. And so it was kind of, so yes, the starting point was definitely looking at that kind of Highland lament. And I'm not an expert in any of these things. Um, so my my research, I wouldn't um, um, I, I wouldn't put myself forward as an expert on it, but from my light research, it was looking at how women would come together to lament the loss of a of um, and sometimes an unknown person. And then I think it was also some of looking at kind of the tradition of women as mourners and as of paid mourners, which is kind of throughout the world. Um, and I was particularly interested in, now I'm gonna remember, forget the word for it, the, the Irish keening tradition as well about women who would, would keen for, would be hired to keen for um, a family who'd lost someone. And there was some, something really interesting to me about the relationship with, that women have to to leading a mourning and leading grieving in communities, but 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 beyond just Scotland, kind of a, a tradition that you find in most cultures where women seem to lead that. So that was um, that was the starting point for me with that. Um, and I kind of forgot what else you were asking me really about kind of unpacking traditions and, and influences and culture. And, um, and I'm sure you're gonna ask me more. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Um, but I think I probably my, my, my big statement would be, you know, um, being brought up in Scotland and sort of you, you, in a way, I suppose I've always felt that Scotland is quite an internationalist outlook and our history is certainly, um, goes beyond our borders and that's something maybe we'll talk about um, soon in terms of its kind of um, history of colonialism and its history and its involvement in the transatlantic slavery. Um, so there's always Scotland's, um, to understand Scotland you always have to understand its position in the world and understand the world. So I think I've always, I wouldn't say I was kind of pro cool in that way and I've never really kind of been one for um, a kind of Scottish canon, literary canon, or being kind of faithful to that. I've always found what's interested me. And it was interesting we were talking about Muriel Spark because one of my great um, inspirations is Janice Galloway. But then, you know, once you start speaking to Janice about her influences, then she's influenced by Muriel Sparks. So it's, even if you don't think that you're influenced by Muriel Spark, you'll find that the people that you're influenced by were. So, you know, there's always that line that you're not even aware of. Um, so. 
Thank you. No, I mean, I, I, I give you both credit because I do know that was a very meaty question, but I think you guys answered it with just such humanity and honesty. So thank you. Um, my next question, uh, I, I was interested, um, specifically Heather, in your exploration of ecology and botany, and then Jeanette, your exploration of Algeria and Scotland. Uh, I will bring them both together. Um, but in sort of our description for the event, we did talk a lot about environment. And so I'm interested in, in hearing from both of you first, and then I can open it up to the to uh, the rest of the panel, but how are your current environments influencing or aspiring your writing? And how are you inspired by environments of the past? And you know, I think it'd be nice to start with you, Heather. Scotland has such a rich history of um, nature poems and, um, and, and some uh, of uh, you know, the most revered nature poems in the world come from Scottish poets. Do you, do you see your poetry as working in heritage with that? Or you know, are you trying to play on, uh, are you subverting it in any way, maybe? That's another large question, <laughs> thank you. Um, no, um, provocation, provocation, yes. Should we put provocation somewhere in between influence and subversion? And I would say that certainly any of the writing that, um, that's happening, that's born out of what I would want to be a, a careful and, and hopefully ethical engagement with, with my lived environment um, would always be provoked um, by, by, by something and, and perhaps by the various resonant words of, of other poets that we have kind of dinning in our ears. I've been bothering the panel for the kind of last 24 hours with a poem by Hugh McDermott, um, <laughs> which, which ends kind of how marvelously descriptive about Scotland being small and incomplete, and I think that a lot of what um, a lot of what I'm going to give you in response to your question about ecology, botany, nature, influence, um, and other things is is that it's a work in progress, um, but is always mediated through kind of a precise attention, as precise as I can make it, with limited knowledge of um, of the environment that surrounds me. Thank you. No, I mean, for it being a, uh, such a weighted question, I think you've answered that so beautifully. And it, I'm really keen then, Jeanette, to, to delve then into your exploration of Algeria and Scotland. And you do it so wonderfully throughout your collection. Um, and, and I just even love the, dis I don't know if that was your decision or in, in, in partnership with the publisher, but to sort of go back and forth between Algeria and Scotland in the poems, you know, it's not really sectioned. Um, how have both of those, you know, do you, do you see yourself as, some, as a poet who plays with environment? You know, the poem you shared with us was about New York City and it was so evocative. Um, you know, I felt like I was going with you on a journey through the subway and, and I could feel the heat coming, you know, from like those iconic steam vents on the street. Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, well, one of my early teachers taught me that the subject matter isn't the issue. Um, even the ordinary can be made extraordinary, um, depending on how you, you train the eye and you tamper with the, the visual aesthetic um, of putting down words and emotions into uh, a kind of amalgamation of, of the human condition, basically, because that's what poets are. They're memory keepers, they're prophets, they're misfits. Um, but in terms of Algeria and Scotland, so Algeria is just, it's in my blood. I mean, we're all a big cross-pollination of ancient civilizations. Um, but there's a time in our life, I think, that we have to kind of, oh, we don't have to. We just find ourselves wanting to question uh, who was before us in our bloodline, what what did they accomplish? Where did they live? And then we feel in our cell self, spirit self, there's this kind of emergence of both of them together, um, speaking, channeling. This is the way that I see it um, from these voices from the past. And they exist in the landscapes um, and the cities. I am also a travel writer. So the environment that I'm in completely envelopes everything that I do because I write what I see. Um, but Scotland's my home, my landing place, the birth land of my mother, 
the birthplace and nest of both my my daughters. It's in my blood, my ancestors. Um, and, and I think that the human condition is never really free from the past. Um, not only do we embody it, but you know the his history is everywhere we look and feel in the streets and the architecture um, and in the storytelling. I think that's the important part is um, poets tell stories and stories, storytelling gets you through those long Icelandic winters. You know, storytelling is what helps us heal um, and what hel helps us get through really difficult times. Um, and what helps us, I guess, as an individual on our own personal plight, um, be able to deal with things in our own life, kind of as you were saying, you were lighting sage this morning. So it's that same kind of thing when I write a poem about a place that I've been in that has a certain memory that's to do with my family. It's like, that. get that sage out, put it in a poem, understand why that notion struck me sideways, because in writing the poem, that's where I'll find the answer. Brilliant, brilliant <laughs> answer. Thank you. Um, before we move to the audience questions, I do want to get one more question in, and I want to hand it to you, Courtney, because I'm very interested in your use of poetry and activism. You, you shared your poem, Skin Friority, with us earlier, which is just so breathtaking. And like I alluded earlier, your poem, Denial, is equally as beautiful, which was um, shared on the Fringe of Color uh, Film Festival. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm an avid follower of yours on Instagram. I think what you do to use your poetry, but then also educate people, especially young people, about activism and history is very um, inspiring. So my question to you is, does poetry have the ability to speak to history, both in the past and present, in ways not captured in our school books or are taught in academic spaces? It is a meaty question, but can the poet do something historians cannot? I, I think definitely. I think that um, poets can kind of bridge that gap in terms of um, intimacy and empathy in ways that, the, you know, the way that we're taught history in school, for example, just doesn't, it doesn't cover it really. And I think, um, you know, the way that um, the sort of the ideas of history are presented to us are for the most part massively skewed. You know, they would have you believe that the first time black and white people interacted with one another was the discovery of the, the new world, you know. And um, I think when we, we look back at history, humans are much more hybridic in nature. Um, you know, you, Scotland itself was arguably named after an Egyptian queen. So how do we how do we explain that? You know, if humans haven't always been migrating, um, I think if there's there's one thing humans do, it's that we we move around and we share ideas. And um, I think in sort of times like this, in sort of polit political and social upheaval, corporate media will always exploit the idea of purity and the idea of purity of culture, purity of race. Um, you know, for, for social control. And um, I think that is really important that we're, we're cognizant of that. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if I actually answered your question. There. No, <laughs> you, you did. And you did so um, with, with such passion. Um, it actually really leads quite well into one of the audience questions. Um, uh, an audience member has asked or has said, and before the question, it has been said that 2020 will need a history book written for each week of the year, as so much has happened. Indeed, um, if you were to write about this year, what would you focus on? Um, maybe we could start with you, Hannah. <laughs> um, it would be hard to focus on one. I think probably leading from what Courtney just said would be empathy. Um, I was reading recently um, in our I think it was the Roger Robinson's manifesto where he talked about it being like an empathy machine. And I think right now, um, and so I think for me as a poet, it's, I'm definitely inspired by the time, but I, it feels like I'm sort of kind of reading the kind of, or I respond to the sort of emotions and the the kind of around me and the, and, and through that, I think one of the, what I've been feeling a lot is that need for empathy, but also that need for um, grieving and, and finding um, comfort and community. So I feel like that would probably drive whatever I wanted to say, um, because I've, um, I think that we um, are desperate for a sense of um, 
a community where we can we, we understand and we have empathy and we have compassion and that we're, we can come together and grieve because this year for me feels a year of, of much death um, from the deaths through COVID, through George Floyd, um, this and and you know and then we have our own George Floyd in in um, Sheikh Bayo. So this is so yeah this this feels like um, yeah it's been a year about Black Lives Matter and um, and thank goodness on some level that that's we emerged. This has always been happening, but it feels like it's taken a center stage, but. But this has also a, been a year of a lot of death. And so I think I would probably write about grief. And I think that would be how I would begin if I was going to talk about 2020. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it would be um, flippant of me to not sort of acknowledge that. And I think um, all four of you as writers approach very serious subjects in such a, a, a generous and giving way. Um, so I think if, if we were to, to read your history book, Hannah, I think we would be all the better for it. I, I know the care that you give. You um, have taken it upon yourself to host a weekly workshop for writers of color living in Scotland. You're a great mentor. Um, and giving the space for people to kind of work through these very harrowing emotions. And I will weave this into the next question because you are Hannah all four of you, but um, Hannah, you are one of uh, the writers living in Scotland that really does inspire me. Um, but our audience is interested in hearing from all of you about who are the writers that inspire you. Uh, and in particular, if you have any writers that inspire you that aren't widely known about. Um, maybe we could start with you, Heather? No? Could we skip me? Okay. It'll, it'll either go on forever, <laughs> like an unfolding scroll. Um, no worries. Um, Jeanette. What was the question? Who are the writers that inspire you? And are there any of these writers that maybe not, may not be widely known about? Um, well, how many of our ancestral grandmothers have been lost or sidetracked or marginalized? So I don't even feel that I have had contact with all the voices that have been before because of the white male supremacy and that anything that has made it to the surface has been you know the creme de la crop of of what they have decided so we always have to as women i think we always have to do some digging we have to go out with what is surface mainstream and find what's hidden you know at the bottom of those bookstores and small prints um um, and dusty bookshops and I just enjoy going on a journey and finding things potluck and seeing if there's something there for me <laughs> and then if there's not you know it gets shut and put away but um, generally if I was going to like call out the big names of the of the legendary greats then I would throw Sylvia Plath, William Carlos Williams, Fernando Pessoa, um, uh, who else? I'm, I'm looking around at all my books but there's there's so many um, and they keep coming, they're endless. And that's the thing, endless horizons of voices out there that we can tap into if we just uh, decide to look and call out about bringing them to the surface and um, you know, not being ostracized from anthologies because we are women and women of color and now it's all changing. So um, it's good, as Hannah said, it's been happening for a while and it's actually really exciting, the buzz that people are finally starting to wake up, you know, and pay attention. And, and even the white male supremacists are saying, yeah, actually, you're right. I, I see you making a very fair point. I'm sorry, show me how we can change. Um, and there's all these new developments and opportunities. And yeah, I'm, I'm really in, really enjoying it at the moment, despite the death and the grief. If we, if we just put that, if we just put it aside for a while and, um, and it's hard to, you know, but into the soil and see what grows. I'm going to jump back in if that's okay. Perfect. That time. Um, so, yet the idea of the hodgepodge and the potluck and the bookshelves has, has kind of sparked kind of my, um, 
my remembrance of my bookshelves, which I can't look at right now, in order to, to kind of glean the inspiration um, that, that is always there. But I think that Jeanette, you speak really kind of soundly about the fact that it's a case of just gra grabbing things and working it out in quite a tactile way. I was looking at my bookshelves the other day and I realized that quite depressingly, every single book that had a head on the spine was a book of poems by a woman. And the men didn't have their heads on the spines. And I feel that, um, that, I mean, does that make you want to kind of reach out and grab the book a little bit more? Or does it make you feel slightly like, well, you know, I don't, I'm not entirely sure if I want to kind of touch their face in order to grab their spine. There's something strange and embodied about it. But, um, but a book that is on one of those shelves that I do remember like, over 10 years ago now, um, being a book that was signed to me in solidarity by a great poet from ac across that ocean, um, Evie Shockley. Um, would, be, would be kind of, and, and the series of her work that I've collected ever since um, w would certainly be a poet who works astonishingly with her voice and with language and inheritance um, in a way that I certainly find always inspires me upon my return to those books. Thank you. Um, Courtney, do you have any writers you'd like to throw into the mix? Um, I think sort of uh, poetry-wise, um, I've always uh, really enjoyed the work of Jasmine Manns. Not sure if you've heard of her. She's uh, absolutely phenomenal. Um, but with regards to the UK, I suppose um, Akala, uh, Kareem Dennis, or Loki, um, they really inspire me for their sort of revolutionary um, sort of sentiments, I suppose. Thank you, thank you. Um, so this next question I'm going to ask, I won't put it forward to anyone if you just want to say, I'll take that. Um, I think to be most uh, egalitarian. Um, the, the audience member has commented how they love the political poems. Uh, their question is, can these poems wake up Scotland to its inherent racism? Um, I'll take that one. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting because I feel that um, I think that that poetry can be, um, if you're open, poetry can ask questions if you if you if you want to hear them. And I think there's certainly a lot of work at the moment um, by artists who are trying or who are challenging some of the kind of master narrative of what Scotland is. And I think that's really important. And I think um, I think that certainly poet poetry can be a space for change and a space to. Um, because it's a, this kind of empathy machine, I think you can you can hear a different experience. But I think the question is whether you're open to that experience or not. And I think maybe you know the importance of having a diverse a kind of you know diverse reading lists and education and um, would be a way to introduce that um, diversity of human experience. And I think through that there can be a possibility for change. So that would be my answer. Also, I'd like to say Jackie Kay. Janice Galloway, Emmett is darker. <laughs> and I could go on <laughs> for a previous question. Thank you. Um, yeah, is there anyone else on the panel that would like to address that question? Or I, I think, um, I mean, we could speak to how poetry does that. Okay. Because yeah. I think, um, I don't know if the rest of the panel might agree, so I'm just going to speak for them. Poetry is inherently political. Um, and, and can and does affect certain modes of change through how it, it operates affectively or empathetically, um, whether it's spoken or listened to or, or looked at. And I think there's, there's the, the other way that poetry can challenge um, what Hannah's called those kind of dominant master narratives is not only through what it's saying, but how it's saying them. So, you know, Who's, who's one for breaking that tyranny of the iambic pentameter line? Sure, it's also doing that. Um, the moment you kind of step up the, and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a sonnet, but it's not quite going to be what you expect it to be. But I'm still going to call it a sonnet, so I'm still going to draw your attention to a tradition that's sort of endemic within the lifeblood of poetry that can be questioned and that is political. That is, there's a poem, you know, a sonnet is a poem of empire, um, if, if, if it is nothing else, as well as being 14 lines long most of the time. Um, but yes, so that would be another part of an answer. 
Thank you. Um, no, I agree. Poetry is political. I think that's quite a good place to end on um, because we do have to wrap up. Um, it's been my great honor to chair this panel with you today, brought to you by the Scottish BAME Writers Network, done in partnership with the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Today, you, had, you and I both had the honor of hearing from Hannah Lavery, Jeanette Ayachi, Courtney Stoddart, and Heather H. Young. Um, I hope you've enjoyed today's event with us. This year's festival program is free of charge for everyone and has been made possible by the generosity of supporters and donors. If you've enjoyed this event, we'd love you to consider making a donation to the Edinburgh International Book Festival so they can continue their great work of putting on events for as many people as possible. So again, I'd like to say thank you to our four panelists, their generosity in sharing deep and meaningful work. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for sharing space and time with us, and to our lovely tech team, who you cannot see, but have been working away behind the cameras to bring us to you wherever you are in the world right now. And I guess we'll all just wave and sign off to you and wish you all a wonderful evening. Uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you.